Hello, welcome back to uh, Eastridge Church men's Bible study called Clear Future, and we are in week five, and we're going to be looking at the second coming of Christ. I want to welcome all of you uh, to this teaching today, and um, one of the things that I have noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed, is that the season has changed. We no longer can wear golf shirts and shorts. Uh, the, the air has uh, gotten colder. The rain has come, the leaves are falling. It is now autumn in the Northwest and uh, those changing seasons. And I like it, but I've got to wear a vest now and longer sleeve shirts. I still will go golfing, but I just won't wear the short sleeve shirts. Uh, but I want to uh, just welcome you as we, uh, as we look at uh, this incredible event that is coming up, the second coming of Christ. Now the second coming of Christ is different than the rapture of the church. Uh, the rapture of the church, Jesus doesn't come all the way back to earth. He, we meet him in the air. He, he delivers the church, raptures the church, the believers and those who have, are dead in Christ, they'll rise first. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them and be with him forever in the air. Uh, but there is coming a time where he will actually set foot back on the earth, which is known as his second coming. And that's after the tribulation. So just a little bit of review here of where we've been in case you're just jumping in now or maybe uh, just a little refresher to know where we're at and the sequencing of events of the end times. In week one, we looked at the signs of the times and how Jesus said there'll come wars and rumors of wars and, and uh, uh, famine and pestilence and, and plagues. Uh, and that these, these signs would come in increasing measure. He likened them to the birth pains. Now I know that as men we can't personally identify with what birth pains feel like, but we know the concept and that is that they start out uh, relatively easy and farther apart, but uh, the closer you get to the birth of the child, the, uh, the contractions, the birth pains increase in frequency and increase in intensity. And that's what's happening and I believe we are we are experiencing those uh, birth pains, the beginning of the end times. I, I, I'm sure you can identify that there are many things that are happening on the face of the earth now. In fact, I would venture to say that all of the things that need to be in line for the coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, and the end time events to unfold are already in place except for one. And that's found in Mark 13 where it says, This gospel must be preached to all nations and then the end will come. And I think that's the last sign to be fulfilled. And that could happen at any moment. You think about the technology, you think about media, you think about the worldwide missions efforts that, that are happening around the world and, uh, and how the gospel is being spread, uh, that we are very, very close to the end time. So week two, we talked about the rapture of the church and how Jesus would deliver his followers uh, from the wrath that is to come. And then we looked at uh, a main character in that seven-year tribulation period called the Antichrist and uh, his operation during that time period, as well as last week, we looked at the tribulation in terms of the seven seal judgments, which unfolded then, the seven trumpet judgments, which unfold then, the seven bowl judgments. And there's a lot of uh, cataclysmic events, a lot of death, a lot of um, terror and uh, difficult things happening on the face of the earth during those seven years. So it brings us to the end of the seven year tribulation period. There's going to be this event called the second coming of Christ. Now the second coming of Christ uh, is, is explained in detail and I'd like for you to have your Bibles open to Revelation chapter 19 uh, verses 11 to 21. That's where we're gonna spend the most of our focus today. Uh, and just uh, make sure you mark that. We're going to look at other passages of Scripture, but uh, this is the one that we will uh, center our, um, our teaching on today. Now, the second coming of Christ is an event that is talked about extensively in Scripture, and it's greatly anticipated. Um, just some facts and figures for you here. Uh, in the Old Testament, 1,527 verses are dedicated to this topic of the second coming of Christ. Even in the Old Testament, it's talked about quite often. 
Uh, in the New Testament, there's over 8,000 verses total in the New Testament, and 330 out of the 8,000 verses refer to the second coming of Christ. That's one in every 25 verses speak of this event. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, spoke of his second coming 21 times, where he talked about the time that he would come back to earth. Uh, references to the second coming of Jesus compared to the first coming of Jesus in Scripture. Uh, second coming outnumbers the first coming eight to one in terms of space of Scripture uh, dedicated to it. Uh, in the New Testament, we're admonished 50 times, over 50 times actually, that we are admonished to be ready for the second coming of Christ. Even all the way back to Genesis 3.15, there's a there's a hint of this event in which uh, it speaks of the fact that the seed of the woman, speaking of the Messiah, speaking of Christ, uh, the serpent, Satan, would bruise his heel, but that the, uh, the seed of the woman, Christ, the Messiah, would crush the serpent's head. There's coming a day where completely and finally the serpent, Satan, the devil, will be fully crushed and defeated here on earth. Uh, all of the, a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament, Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, all spoke, amongst others, about this second coming. Paul speaks of it uh, in very vivid terms in both letters to the church in Thessalonica, First and Second Thessalonians. But I love this passage in 2 Timothy 4.8. You might write that down and just circle it to go back to later. But Paul says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all, notice this phrase, who have loved or longed for his appearing. Uh, I want to just uh, challenge you men that this is an event that we need to long for, we need to love and anticipate and uh, look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I think about events in my life where I was anticipating the arrival of something or someone uh, very important and dear to me. Uh, my parents talk about the fact that when I was home from my, uh, uh, between the summer of my junior and senior year in college, um, I had met Lizette, my, which, who would become my, my wife. I'd met her at Northwest College, now Northwest University. And, uh, and that's back in the day when we didn't have uh, cell phones and texting and email. Uh, and that summer when she was over in the Salem, Oregon area, and I was in Redmond, Oregon working, uh, we, were, uh, we were engaged, uh, but I was anticipating uh, a letter uh, that would come weekly. I would wait and wait, and I'd go out to the mailbox and if a letter wasn't there, I would be downcast, my parents would say, and have a sad look on my face. And if it came, boy, my whole world just lit up. Uh, I looked forward to the times when I could see her again or when she would come over and visit me. Uh, fast forward a little bit. I looked forward and longed for uh, the appearing of our own children uh, as they were born. Uh, and now, uh, you may or may not know this, but in, uh, in just a few, a couple of weeks or less, my daughter is going to give us our second grandchild. We're anticipating the arrival of our granddaughter, and we're excited about that. But there's that sense of longing and loving for the appearing of someone or something uh, that we value or love. And that should be the attitude, and that should be the anticipation and the expectation of our heart, that we long for the Lord to appear. And the exciting thing is, as believers, we're going to appear with him. We are going to come back to earth with him. And we'll get into that in our teaching today. Well, let's look at some things about uh, the second coming of Christ that we find in Revelation chapter 19. If you look at verse 11, um, <clears throat> John says, Then I saw heaven opened. This is interesting because earlier in Revelation 4, John said a door in heaven was opened and he was invited to come in and take a peek at what was happening in heaven. So the door was open to let John in. Now a door is open to let Christ out as he comes back to earth. It says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. Uh, the first time John saw a lamb. This time he sees a white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So the first thing I want us to notice here is that Christ's second coming will be sudden and it will be swift. It's not a progressive thing that slowly happens uh, or takes a long period of time. This is going to be a sudden, immediate, cataclysmic event when Christ comes back to earth. And the reason I mention that is that there are some uh, post-millennialist view that it's, it's referred to. There are some that believe that there is a, a quiet sort of coming of the kingdom of God, that there's this sort of merging of this age into the next age, and that maybe we could even be in the kingdom right now and not even really know it or perceive it. We're just sort of sliding in, and there's a bit of a transition period. But I find that foreign to Scripture, especially here. It's going to be a sudden event. Suddenly, behold, heaven opens, a white horse, the one riding on it. It's called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Heaven opens, and out bursts Jesus onto the scene, riding a white horse. The second thing I want us to see about this, the second coming of Christ is that Christ will come this time as conquering king. He's coming as a warrior. He's coming as a warrior king, conquering. He's coming to, to fight a battle, to fight the final battle, and he's going to come victorious. In fact, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5, I'll read it for you. You have it referenced there in your notes. Uh, speaks of this, uh, gives us a preview of this event all the way back in Isaiah. He says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Isaiah is talking about this event, the second coming. And he's talking and prophesying about how the fact that Jesus will come and he will be a righteous judge. He will be faithful and righteous and true. It sounds exactly like what John is describing in his vision in John 19. And that he is going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He will come in judgment. And he will bring all things uh, under his control and under his rule. Uh, verse 13 of Revelation 19 tells us a little bit more. Not only is he faithful and true and righteous, that's the name of, of the one riding on the white horse. Think about that. Faithful. He's faithful to his promise. He said he would come back. He is fulfilling that. He's faithful to that promise. Every one of his promises are faithful. His word is true. That is in stark contrast to the Antichrist and the, the false prophet and the dragon who are deceiving and, and untrue and liars. And, and uh, Jesus is going to come and he is faithful and true and righteous, not unrighteous. But notice here in verse 13, it says that he will be clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Now, this is not blood of redemption. Uh, this, is, uh, this is blood that speaks of of warfare and battle. And you've got to remember that uh, uh, this is not the first battle of the Lord. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But Isaiah 63, 1 through 6 talks about this. It says, Who is this who comes from Edom in crimsoned garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. And the answer, It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. The question why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? And the answer is, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I trampled down the people in my anger, and I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Wow. This is very descriptive of the fact that the blood on the garment is representative of the uh, 
of the blood that will be shed in that final battle and also representative of the, the battles that Christ has fought throughout history and the bloodshed that takes place. Uh, Revelation 14, let's go there for a second uh, because I want to set up this event a little bit for you. But Revelation 14, verses 14 to 20, let's read those verses. It says um, in verse 14, John says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress, notice, of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. It's about 184 miles, about 200 miles, up to the horse's bridles filled with blood. Speaking of this warrior king Jesus who will come for this final battle. And uh, we see in, in chapter 16, uh, again, where will this battle take place? In chapter 16 of Revelation, verses 15 and 16, it says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go out, go out naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. In the valley of Megiddo, uh, the valley of Jehoshaphat, uh, the valley of Megiddo will be the battle of Armageddon. And so John in Revelation 19.1, this time doesn't see a lamb. He sees a white horse. Now, some would say uh, that that, it, does this mean that horses are glorified and going, I don't know. Uh, but you need to understand that um, in Revelation, apocalyptic literature, uh, literature of the end times, uh, oftentimes symbolism is used to point to reality. And, and certainly symbolism is being used by John here in this vision. Uh, that is pointing to a reality that Jesus will come. He'll come as a conquering king. It was symbolic of a Roman conqueror who had come on a white horse, coming back into uh, Rome in triumphal procession, uh, riding on a white horse. So the readers, the hearers uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this book originally uh, would have seen that symbolism easily. Uh, and this is... Uh, this is interesting because it's in contrast to the first coming of Christ to earth. Remember when he came the first time to earth, he came as a babel, baby. He came as a humble servant, as a suffering servant on the cross. Uh, Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The first time he comes to redeem the world from sin as a humble, suffering servant. The second time he comes, he will come to destroy the wicked, to overthrow the Antichrist, overthrow the false prophet, to bind Satan and take control of the earth. He's coming as a conquering king. I'm excited about that, aren't you? That finally, once and for all, Satan will be bound. And Revelation 1.7 says that every eye will see him. And speaking of eyes, it says in Revelation 19.12 that this one riding on the white horse will have eyes like a flame of fire. What is that symbolizing? Well, I think it's, it symbolizes the fact that nothing escapes his notice. He comes to execute perfect judgment and the purifying aspect of his judgment that wickedness has gone on long enough. He's been patient He's been uh, slow to anger, slow to wrath, but now the wrath of God is being poured out. Eyes like fire that penetrate, that see, that purify. It also says that on his head are many diadems or crowns. Um, 
Now, whether that's literal or figurative or symbolic, the truth of the matter is that he will have royal rank, regal authority. That's the symbolism is pointing to that reality. He'll have ultimate sovereignty. Now, as you're reading through Revelation, and we've been touching on it, Satan, uh, the dragon is spoken of as having crowns. The Antichrist is spoken of having crowns. The rulers of the world having crowns. What is going to happen in this moment is that when Jesus comes back, all crowns will be yielded to him throughout all time. He will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's a phrase here also that says he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And often what happens, it's hard for us to accept something like that. And so we say, what is that name? Well, the answer is no one knows but Christ himself. Uh, and I think that speaks to the fact that, you know, there's much that we know about the Lord and, and we grow in our knowledge and, and even become familiar in a sense with who Jesus is uh, with our limited minds and experience. But when, when we uh, have the full experience of seeing Jesus uh, in all his glory, there's going to be mysteries and depths that we have never heard of, that we've never experienced. Uh, the glory of the Lord is so majestic and so mysterious and wonderful. Um, again, he will be clothed in a robe that is dipped in blood. It's not his first battle. He battled, I'm sure, he was the one leading the war with Pharaoh in, in, in the exodus of, of the people of God. He was the one leading in battle as the commander of the hosts of the heavenly armies with Joshua at Jericho on throughout history. Even the battle on the cross as he shed his own blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, this will be the final battle as he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Notice here it says also that he will have the name by which he is called the Word of God. This speaks of, of the divinity of Christ because John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says later in verse 14 of John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And so uh, it's interesting here that there are names that are given Jesus as he's coming back. You see the one name that's given, a name which no one knows. That speaks of his essential deity. He's God. He's mysterious. He's beyond us. But he's also called the word of God in this passage which speaks of his incarnate deity, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But then he's also given the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which speaks of his sovereign deity, that he is totally in charge, he's totally in control. He's coming as conquering king. That is so exciting and certainly something to look forward to. The third thing we see about the second coming of Christ is that Christ will come with the armies of heaven. He's not coming alone. It says here in verse 14 that there, there are the armies of heaven who are arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. They were following him on white horses. So the question are the question that arises are who are these who make up the armies of heaven? Who are these individuals? Who are these people? Who are these beings that make up the armies of heaven? Well, the, the fact that they're arrayed in fine linen, they're white and pure, uh, gives us some clues. And we can look elsewhere, not only in, in, uh, in Revelation, uh, in fact, even earlier in this chapter, in chapter 19, look at verses 7, or excuse me, chapter uh, 19, uh, verse uh, 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her... Notice, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Uh, certainly amongst those who are riding with the, uh, Jesus as he rides on the white horse leading the way will be the bride of Christ, the church, the saints of the living God who have been raptured and now we're coming back with Christ uh, to rule and reign on the earth. Uh, back in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and verses 13 and 14, it speaks of the same imagery here of those who are tribulation saints who, 
who endured and or, or were martyred even during the tribulation, but uh, proclaim faith in Christ. Uh, they will be dressed in white, pure, uh, white garments. The tribulation saints will certainly make up those who are in that army. Uh, we find in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So we know that uh, the, the church, the bride of Christ, the saints, we know the tribulation saints, uh, those who come to faith in Christ during the tribulation, and the armies of heaven are made up of the hosts of heavenly angels that will come with him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.2 tells us what we will be doing. And this is getting into next week's teaching a little bit, but it says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? We'll come to rule and to judge with this conquering king. We're part of the armies of heaven. And uh, next week we'll get into Revelation 20 where we will rule with Christ during that thousand year reign on earth called the millennium. It's going to be exciting. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Riding back with Christ to defeat Satan once and for all, to bring justice, to bring mercy. And we get to be in that triumphal procession with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Fourthly, the coming of Christ is to establish his kingdom. To establish his kingdom. Revelation 19, 15. Notice it says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword. This is interesting. It's going to be a sword that has slaying power to execute judgment and, uh, and righteousness. And it's going to come out of his mouth. In other words, it's not going to be a long, prolonged battle. It's going to be quickly over. Uh, he's going to speak and it's done. Much like uh, the world was spoken into existence, the universe was spoken into existence, or like the time when Jesus spoke to the fig tree and it withered, or the times that he spoke to the demons and they were cast out, or the time that he spoke to Lazarus and said, come forth, and he was raised from the dead. The powerful word of the Lord out of his mouth will come judgment and the battle will be won and the kingdom will be established. Notice here it says that he will strike down the nations. And I think this is important to know. We are not going to be the ones executing the judgment. It will be Jesus and Jesus alone. He'll strike down the nations. We're just writing and uh, experiencing that uh, with him to rule with him. It says here that he will rule with a rod of iron, a rod of iron. And that he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. This is a vivid picture of the stomping of the grapes in the winepress, which, uh, which is symbolic of the bursting of the blood. It's not going to be a, a very clean and uh, antiseptic uh, war and battle. It's going to be a lot of bloodshed. And, uh, but he will be ruling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I want to encourage you to read Psalm 2 because it speaks of this in more detail, even as a prophecy ahead of time speaking of this second coming. But he is going to come and establish his rule and his kingdom here on earth. And the fifth and final thing I want to say about Christ's second coming is that it will involve a final battle, a final battle. Uh, notice verses 17 and 18. It says here in verses 17 and 18 that there will be a great supper of God. And that great supper of God is basically going to be the flesh and the blood of those who were defeated in the battle of Armageddon. Uh, and it will be a supper offered to the birds, it says, uh, that will be feasting upon the carnage of the warfare. Now, I want to just stop here and say it's a stark contrast to another supper that will take place. And that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see that in earlier in chapter 19, speaking of the fact that we, the marriage supper of the Lamb is prepared for the bride of Christ and all the saints uh, and the victorious ones, that we will participate in a supper, which is a celebratory supper, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But this great supper of God is going to be a supper for the birds. The birds will feast upon the flesh of the wicked upon the flesh of the evil here on earth in the mopping up the battle of Armageddon. Uh, speaking of this, 
There's a quote from Donald Barnhouse in his commentary. He was commentating on this and he said, when our Lord was on the earth the first time, he told his disciples of a great feast to which all men were bidden to come freely. Love set the table and compassion was there to serve. Grace sat as host and joy poured the wine. For almost 2000 years, the Lord has sent out his servants, crying the invitation to one and all. And for almost 2000 years, men for the most part have flouted the love that invited them and despised the grace that pleaded with them. Still, they bring forth the flimsy excuses of a newly married wife or of an unseed field or of unproven yoke of oxen. Still, the carnal mind thus proves itself at enmity against God. The Lord is the God of patience, but patience will not be mocked forever. The day of wrath must come, and those who have refused the call of grace to the banquet of love must be themselves the victims at another great supper where their flesh will be picked clean by the fowls of the air. Wow, very descriptive. But it brings to mind the fact that Jesus uh, is very patient and very merciful and offers grace and an invitation to a banquet uh, of the redeemed. But there will continually, all the way up to this final battle, be those who blaspheme, who reject, who... Uh, who will refuse to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And uh, so judgment will come in this final battle. In fact, Joel 3, 2 says, Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Uh, this is not the final judgment of the ungodly, this final battle of Armageddon. It's simply their execution. Uh, the final judgment comes later, and we're going to look at that uh, in the coming weeks, at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. But this is their execution, and they will be held in hell until that final judgment where they'll be cast with Satan and his demons, along with the Antichrist and the beast, into the final place, the lake of fire. I want to look at Revelation chapter 16, if you will. Turn with me there to Revelation 16, verses 13 to 16. It says here that, uh, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of the God Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that is called Armageddon. You may be asking yourself, wouldn't these kings and wouldn't these armies know that they're heading right into their final execution and, and final demise? And my answer to that is they have been uh, unleashed upon them, the deceiving demonic spirits from Satan who has deluded them and they've bought into it. And they are coming to this final battle place called Armageddon. And uh, the great thing about this battle is that it says the beast, which is the Antichrist, and the false prophet, who is forcing everyone to worship the Antichrist, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Can I hear an hallelujah and an amen? That they will be defeated. In fact, Daniel 7.11 says, I looked and because the sound of a great words that the horn was speaking... And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. Wow. Well, let's wrap it up in verse 21 of Revelation 19. It says, And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. A somewhat gruesome ending, a somewhat uh, bloody uh, final battle but the reality is Jesus will come we will come with him and Jesus in a word will speak and it'll all be over uh, that Satan will be defeated the antichrist and the beast or, uh, the antichrist who's the beast and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire and we're going to begin what we'll get into next week as the thousand year millennial reign here on 
earth as Christ has established his kingdom. Wow, these are exciting things. And I want to just challenge you. We ought to long for his appearing. We ought to long and love and look forward to the fact that he will come back and we will come with him. That's exciting. We won't go through the tribulation. We will come with him at the end of the tribulation to win that final victorious battle that he will defeat and we'll get to rule with Christ here on earth. I want to encourage you, man. Every day you're facing battles, but know this. The skirmishes that we're fighting now, and it seems like the enemy may be gaining ground, remember this. The end of, of it all ends in defeat for Satan. And that if we are with Christ and Christ is in us, we might have battles that we lose or, or uh, feel like we're defeated, but we will win the war. It's assured because Christ will come back. He'll make all things right. He will rule in righteousness and judge justice because he is faithful and he is true. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the promise of your coming. I thank you that you do not leave us as orphans. You will come back. And those of us who know you will be raptured to be with you. But we will also come back with you that you will return to this earth a second time, not as a humble suffering servant. You'll come as a conquering mighty warrior. And Lord, we thank you that you are victorious over sin. You're victorious over Satan. You're victorious over death. And you will rule and reign upon this earth once again. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with me and enjoy your discussion together.